Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto awaken with the power of God's Hades in the Percy Jackson universe? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. A 8 year old Naruto could be seen running for his life again. From what you might ask, well the very people that were supposed to protect him from the mobs, which were chasing after him as well. Suddenly he felt something wrap around his legs and make him fall on his face. He looked back and saw four white animal masks staring back, just some random anbu. One was holding the end of the wire wrapped around his legs. He tried to wiggle his way out of it but before he could the mob had caught up to him. The anbu just waited until he was near death to break it up. All right you had your fun now get out of here. The crowd quickly dispersed because no one messed with the anbu. Hey. What do you say to a little jutsu practice? If you could see the others' faces they would all have evil smirks on them. They all ran through the hand seals and called out. Fire style. Dragon fire technique. Lightning style. Lightning dragon missile. Earth style. Great earth dragon release. Wind style. Great breakthrough. Water style. Liquid bullet technique. But before they can hit a huge earth wall rose out of the earth and stopped the attacks. The ambu paled and took a step back. Why? because the Hokage was on top of it with a very pissed off look. That's all Naruto remembers before passing out from blood loss. Two hours later he woke to find himself on the couch in the Hokage's office. He looked to the desk to see the Hokage shooting fireball after fireball at the stake of paper on the desk only to be put out every time by small waterballs coming from three shadows in the room. He sweat dropped at the scene before him. Damn it. Cat, weasel, dog stop this instant. I am going to kill this monstrosity once and for all, he yelled. There were two chuckles and a giggle from the shadows. Sorry no can do. You have to do the paperwork just like the other cages, said the shadow that giggled. Just as she said that one of the fireballs made it through and hit the pile. Yes. I did it I did it. I am the second cage to ever defeat the dreaded paperwork. Dame you Minato for not leaving your secret but oh well. He started to laugh insanely. That is until the fire died down to reveal an untouched pile of paper. Nnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnn
At first I wanted you to try to have a normal life in your home but as things turned out differently than I had hoped I wish for you to come to my world and go to a camp for other half-bloods such as yourself. It will keep you safe. Also Zeus would have killed you if he found out I had a kid, old sibling rivalry and such. I asked the Sandem to watch you because he seemed the wisest person there. I also told him to send you to this apartment when he thought it was time for you to know. Son this is probably a lot for you to take in, but I want you to now I will and always will love no matter what you do. I'm going to tell you why this village will most likely hate you is because the Kyubi had broken out of its prison in the pits of Tartarus. I sealed him in you because only you could hold him and he will more than likely help you with your training due to the facts of the demon not wanting a weak host and not wanting to die. Now in this scroll is a teleporting technique only beings with the blood of a god or goddess can pre for. Also because of me being your father one of your elements is going to be fire. Ask the Sandiami for some chakra paper to determine your other elements if you have any. Your mother was a very skilled ninja when she was alive and left you all of her jutsu for you. While from me you can use the flames of hell as well as being able to raise the dead. I also left a scroll sealed in this one for all of these things. You can also command the lesser monsters among other things. With them comes more things in this scroll. Books on English and Ancient Greek, books on mythology, a summoning scroll, some of our world cloths that will fit you when you decide to come because of their magic, and instructions on how beings with god or goddess blood teleport. Either if you come here or stay where you at we will always be proud and believe in what you believe in. From your caring father and mother, Hades and Kashina. He heard the cat Anbu coming in and quickly hid the scroll. He needed to think this through before doing anything. That night drip 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 Naruto awoke in a sewer looking at a huge cage with a slip of paper on it that said seal. Where the hell am I? Naruto asked looking around the gloomy sewer that keeps letting water drip. So I can finally call my container, said a voice inside the cage as a giant fox stepped forward, about damn time, I've been in here forever with nothing to do dumbass. It groaned. So you're the Kyubi right? That's what the scroll said. He asked in an all too calm voice, you don't seem so scary to me. Good, you found the scroll so this will be much easier. As for the comment about me not being scary. With that said he released a sudden burst of his demonic killing intent. Naruto could barely breathe due to the invisible pressure bearing down on him. Naruto shook his head after Kayubi released it and regained his composure. Look I don't like our arrangements so I'm going to make you a deal. Kayubi said with a growing smirk. Naruto's eyes narrowed. What kind of deal? This better not be a trick. He warned the demon, but was also interested in what he had to say. Kayubi let out a disturbing chuckle before continuing. Simple you let me free and me and all other kitsunes I command will act as your summons and only ones of you blood will be able to sign the contract. The great demon laid all of his chips on the proverbial table and waited for a response. Naruto became enraged. I knew it. You're just gonna get out and say you'll give me that contract but I won't survive the separation. Why you lowly? He didn't get to finish. Quiet whelp. I am going to leave you with a tail of chakra so your body has time to adjust to not having me in it and you'll also keep your healing abilities so don't even try that lame ass excuse. But it will also make your chakra slightly demonic. Nothing major but you'll gain some feral qualities. Kayubi all but roared. He was upset a mere child had questioned his word as a demon lord. Naruto thought it out for a couple of minutes. Fine fox you have a deal. When will this happen? Right now, the process will be done by morning, but you'll be in extreme pain for a few days so take it easy. I'll leave a scroll containing your training schedule that you are to practice every day until you leave and even after that. If you slack off any skills you may gain will fade away if not constantly practiced. You ready kit? Naruto took a deep breath before giving Kayubi the go ahead. Then he felt pain he had never before and blacked out. The next morning Naruto awoke to his body shouting in pain. Every muscle screamed for him to stop moving but he ignored them and reached for the scroll on his nightstand and began to read. Kit inside the seal is the Kitsune summoning scroll. I only expect you to call me we you have absolutely no other choice or if you just wanna have a drink. Naruto sweat dropped at that. I've put a summoning tattoo on your left shoulder reaching to your elbow. It allows you to use less chakra when summoning us. He turned his head to see a tattoo of a nintailed fox preparing to pounce with tribal murkings around it. Naruto then got a twitch on his forehead. How could he have missed that? And below is your training schedule, enjoy.
Training schedule gravity weight, wear all times. 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock equals stealth, can be pranks, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock equals chakra control. 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock equals ninjutsu and element training 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock equals practice with trench knives. 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock equals fuinjutsu, sp. 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock equals swordsmanship. 2 o'clock equals fire manipulation control 3 o'clock to 4.30 equals ninja studying. 4.30 to 6 o'clock equals Greek mythology studying 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock equals training with summons. 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock equals survival skill and endurance Naruto paled, he is a ing slave driver but I am going to need it to survive in the long run. Thought Naruto, when the time comes I am going to leave the elemental countries and go home. This was the start of demi-god Uzumaki Naruto. Eight years later Naruto was now 16 years old and was about 50 miles from the village getting ready to do the dimensional spell. The last eight years had been rough to say the least. Kayubi's training program had worked him into the ground day in and day out. He could proudly say he was at least mid-cage level. He told the old man what he wanted to do and he had said just to drop by to say hello once in a while. He made a mental note to drop in a see the old man. He never joined the academy saying it would get in the way of his trawing so he had nothing to hold him back here except the old man, and the ambu dog, cat, and weasel. Itachi never killed his clan. Naruto had long, blonde, spiky hair in a low ponytail reaching between his shoulder blades with black streaks in it. He was six feet one, and built like a swimmer. He wore black shirt with a red skull with its mouth open, one, on it and black jeans with black and red combat boots. It was all topped off with a black trench coat that was unbuttoned. Under the cloak were about twenty trench and throwing knives in all shapes and sizes. On his hip is a pistol full of celestial bronze bullets for all sorts of situations and more in scrolls in his cloak. His kitsune summoning scroll was hung on his shoulders hanging off his back. Like Jiraiya wears his. Goodbye old man and hello dad. He said as he finished his last hand seal. There was a flash followed by a low boom and he was gone. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X unknown location Naruto groaned and opened his eyes and saw an at least seven foot tall man. The immortal was an imposing figure, with his pale complexion and coal black eyes. His ebony hair, straight as an arrow's shaft, flowed down to his shoulders, framing his face and giving it a shadowed look. He wore a classic rock outfit of the darkest onyx making him look similar to McJagger. If one looked carefully, then they would see that the throne behind him would shift and one could almost make out the faces of the many tormented souls sewn together to make it. Hello son. It is good to see you. Hades stated with the smallest of smiles. Then he frowned a little. I thought you would have stayed at your home where you were safe. Naruto gave a deadpan look to his father. Dad that place was just about as safe as the lowest levels of the underworld. And you should know the only one I cared for was the old man and he was okay with me leaving. That place wasn't my home. Naruto finished. Hades nodded in understanding. Aside from the obvious what happened to the Kyubi. Naruto just smiled and pulled around the Kitsune summoning scroll. His father's eyes widened slightly before returning to normal. Hades smiled slightly again before speaking to his son. We're at war with the Titans again Naruto and we need all the help we can get. Now before you ask I wish for you to go retrieve your two half-siblings from Westover Hall in Bar Harbor, Maine. Right now you're in LA. Naruto's eyes widened. WW wait. Isn't that like a week's worth drive at least how much time do I have to get there? Naruto was getting frantic yet also excited at the prospect of having younger siblings. Hades chuckled dryly. You have to be there by tomorrow. And before you say anything I have a gift for you that'll get you there in time. After you get them I want you all to head to Camp Half Blood. I know some heroes are already on their way but I trust you more with this Naruto. Now say hello to the hellbike, he said as he presented his gift. A sea of flames they paired in a circle around a motorcycle. It was your standard Harley bike. Its wheels were on fire, literally, and it had a metal skull on the front with flames in its eyes making the bike look demonic. Needless to say Naruto was happy. Cool dad. So this'll get me there in time? Naruto half asked as he inspected the bike. Hades chuckled yet again. Yes and this will transform into something less conspicuous when you give it a mental command. Here you'll also need this. He said as he handed his son a necklace with a black chain and what looked to be a tiny sword hanging off of it. What does it do? 
Naruto asked as he put it on. All you have to do is place a finger on it and give it a mental command to prepare for battle. I have a feeling you'll need it. Alright dad I'll go and pick him up and head to that camp you told me about. What are their names? Naruto got on his new ride and was about to leave when Hades stopped him. Now Naruto, softly first, and their names are Nico and Bianca D'Angelo, he said as a helmet appeared on his head. It was black with the same smiling red skull that was on the back of his trench coat. Naruto grumbled something unintelligible before taking off. With the Olympian gods the Olympians, no matter where they were, felt a powerful being coming through a dimensional rift. When they tried to locate it all attempts failed. They became curious except for Hades who knew it was Naruto that had quased this ruckus. No one noticed his discomfort except for Athena and Zeus who were analyzing his reaction. The other gods were talking among themselves wondering what it could be. This being is strong, maybe as strong as a minor god. We will monitor this being later and see what the fates hold for it later. Back to your duties, said Zeus in a non-caring manner in a message he sent to all of the gods. The other gods went back to their business with Hades hoping Naruto wouldn't cause too much trouble. Sigh. Naruto I have a feeling this is going to be a whole lot of trouble. Hades thought to himself before heading to meet his brother Zeus about setting up a meeting with all the other Olympian gods to inform them of Naruto. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He wore a black helmet with a smiling red skull where his face should be and had on a black trench coat and cargo pants and black combat boots. The figure squeezed his blade's hilt and it turned into a necklace. He then got off and took his helmet off. It was Naruto Uzumaki. Blonde hair and all. The sound of the chopper that had arrived snapped them from their stupor. Artemis turned it into a bunch of birds. Then everyone noticed the new arrival walking calmly towards Nico and Bianca. Percy acted without thinking and got in front of them with his blade riptide ready to defend them. Then Naruto suddenly disappeared and reappeared behind Percy not even breaking in his stride toward the D'Angelo children. This stunned everyone, including Artemis, who was surprised a mortal could move with such speed. Naruto stopped right in front of the D'Angelo children and stared at them with an expressionless gaze. Both squirmed under it. Naruto then smiled widely and crouched down to Nico's level, who was quite a bit shorter than him. The stranger spoke softly but everyone heard him due to the unnatural silence. Nico and Bianca D'Angelo. Children of Hades, my siblings. Welcome to the family. My name is Naruto and I'm your half-brother. At this point everyone's eyes were wide as saucers but none more so than the D'Angelo's. Bianca gained her voice first. What do you mean brother? She asked. And what do you mean children of Hades? Naruto kept smiling a kind smile, or it looked like it as no one could see due to his mask, and answered her and everybody else's unasked question. Exactly as it sounds, we have the same father but different mothers. The Greek gods and goddesses are real. One of them, Lady Artemis, is standing right over there. Our father is the god of the underworld and dead, Hades, and he sent me to make sure you both made it. I just recently met him and he asked me to escort you both to Camp Half Blood and stay there with you. Besides, I always wanted a family. This'll be my chance, I'll be your big bro and take care of you guys, that is if you'll let me. What do you say? Naruto asked with a kind smile, but there was a hope in his eyes that wished they would accept his offer for him to be their big brother. Nico almost cried. Yes, 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 I always wanted a big brother. And a family. The last part was whispered, but Naruto and Bianca heard him. Naruto only smiled wider, and Bianca looked a little shocked. They both turned to her, hoping for her to chose to be a part of the family they were trying to form. Bianca looked conflicted. On the one hand, she really didn't want to believe him, but another part of her knew he only spoke the truth. She was tired of always being responsible for her brother. Not to say she didn't love Nico, she was just tired. Now she had a chance just to be a part of a family and not be the one in charge. She looked up resolution in her eyes. Everyone leaned in to hear her answer. I would like to be a family. Please, Bianca said then asked hoping he wouldn't treat her differently just because they only had the same father. Naruto gave a crinkled eye smile. What, you expected I would have said no even though I offered in the first place? Beyonce blushed as she realized what she said. Artemis took control of the situation from there. We've burdened these children enough. Zoe. We will rest here for a few hours. Raise the tents. Treat the wounded. Retrieve our guests' belongings from the school. Yes, Lady Artemis. Zoe answered dutifully. And, Bianca, come with me. I would like to speak with you. Artemis continued. Bianca hesitated for a second. She worked up courage to talk to the immortal being. Amel, um, Lady Artemis, could Naruto come too, possibly? She asked, stumbling as she was getting used to the idea of the gods being real. Artemis' face didn't change from its emotionless facade. After a few moments of silence she spoke. Very well, as long as he is respectful. Now come we have something to discuss. Artemis then turned around and walked towards the first tent the hunters had put up. Everyone was shocked about the goddess answer none more though than Zoe. Naruto didn't give a reaction merely looked on and started to follow Artemis along with Bianca. Nico spoke up though before they had left. What about me? Naruto turned towards him. Stay here for the moment. Your sister and I will be back soon enough. Naruto then looked at Percy, Annabeth, and Grover. I am trusting his safety to you three. If anything happens to him. He left the threat hanging to scare the trio while adding some killing intent. It worked as Grover scrambled over to Nico to listen about some mythomagic game while Percy and Annabeth took the standard lookout position. Talia watched this with a raised eyebrow. Hum. Maybe I get him to teach me how to do that. She thought as she went over to the trio. When Naruto and Bianca arrived in the big tent Artemis had a deer laying its head on her lap. It had glittering fur and silver horns. Come, 
Sit down I have an offer for Bianca. They both did so. No use in angering a god. Artemis looked at Bianca. I would like for you to hear me out fully before making a decision. I wish for you to be a hunter. You would be one of my maidens, and a mortal only able die in battle. The only thing you must give in return is a promise to swear off men forever. What do you say? Naruto merely closed his eyes we he heard Artemis offer to Bianca. We she turned to him with a distraught look on her face Naruto sighed. Bianca it is your choice. I will support you no matter what you choose. But you should know that accepting means you will very rarely see Nico and I. I'm not trying to get you to say no but you should know what it would affect. Mostly Nico as he would be hurt, but we are family and that will never change no matter your choice. Naruto spoke calmly so he would not offend Artemis or Zoe. Artemis and Zoe were surprised by his small speech. Zoe scowled a second later. TCH he is probably trying to manipulate her into staying. All men are the same. Artemis only raised a brow. Hum I do not know what to make of this man. He spoke no lies and seems to be only looking after his family. I will have to look more into him to see if he is honest about his intentions. Bianca took a few minutes to think. She looked at Artemis before speaking. I'm sorry Lady Artemis but I just got a family and I would like to keep it. Sorry. She finished. Artemis sighed. No need to apologize. Not many would choose family over immortality. Your choice says much about your strong will. No come we all must leave this place and you demigods have to return to your camp. They all got up and headed for the other half-bloods. When Artemis said they would be departing Percy told the goddess what Thorn had said. Artemis only narrowed her eyes when she heard the information. Zoe looked at her patron. The scent my lady. She questioned for confirmation. Yes, was her reply. Naruto narrowed his eyes. Wait a minute. What is the scent? Artemis sighed. Things are stirring that I have not hunted in millennia. She murmured. Pray so old I have nearly forgotten. She stared at Percy intently. We came here tonight sensing the manticore, but he was not the one I seek. Tell me again, exactly what Dr. Thorne said. Percy was nervous being put on the spot. Um, I hate middle school dances. No, no. After that, Artemis said started to get annoyed. He said somebody named the general was going to explain things to me. Zoe paled when she heard that. She turned to Artemis and started to say something, but Artemis raised her hand. Go on, Percy. Well, then Thorne was talking about the great stir pot, Bianca corrected him. Stirring. Percy recovered quickly after that. Yeah, and he said, soon we shall have the most important monster of all the one that shall bring about the downfall of Olympus. Percy finished. The goddess was so still she could have been a statue. Zoe looked like she was trying very hard not to be afraid. She tried to say something again, but Artemis cut her off. No, I've been too slow to see the signs. I must hunt this monster alone. Zoe nodded. What shall we do then my lady? She queried. You shall go to the camp with the half-bloods. I will find this creature. Artemis vowed. And I shall bring it to Olympus by the winter solstice. It will be all the proof I need to convince the council of the gods of how much danger we are in. Naruto had a bad feeling about the entire situation. He looked at Artemis before speaking. You know what this monster is don't you? He asked. Artemis gripped her bow. Let us pray I am wrong. Was all she said. Naruto chuckled. Can goddesses pray? He asked. This cause everyone to relax slightly. A flicker of a smile played across Artemis lips. Before I go. Naruto Uzumaki, I have a small task for you. Naruto gave her his patent eye smile. Does it involve getting turned into a jackalope? Naruto asked. Sadly, no, I want you to escort the hunters back to Camp Half-Blood. They can stay there in safety until I return. Zoe didn't like this one bit. What? She blurted out. But Artemis, we hate that place. The last time we stayed there, she tried to finish but Artemis cut her off. Yes, I know, she said, but I'm sure Dionysus will not hold a grudge just because of a little, ah, misunderstanding. It's your right to use cabin aid whenever you are in need. Besides, I hear they rebuilt the cabins you burned down, Artemis said in a stern tone. Zoe only muttered something about foolish campers. But Artemis continued as if nothing happened. And now I will call my brother for a ride to get you all to camp before I depart. 
He will be here at dawn. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Yes, my lady. Artemis sprinted off into the woods and melted with the shadows. Apollo flashed another dazzling smile. All right I don't like getting out of sports car mode but this is the only way we can all fit. He took out his keys and beeped the security alarm. The sports car glowed brightly. When it died down the Maserati was replaced by a charter bus. Apollo grinned, jangling the car keys on his finger. So, who wants to drive? The statement caught many off guard. When Naruto raised his hand Zoe slapped it down. Naruto touched his motorcycle and it turned into a pair of forearm bracers with hidden blades in them. 1. As everyone loaded onto the bus Apollo pulled Naruto aside. Hey you got any more of those books? He said in a pervy whisper. The drive to Camp Half-Blood was, interesting to say the least. Apollo had insisted that Talia drive them back. Which in, hindsight, wasn't a good idea. She was shaking the entire time, like she had experienced something traumatic. Naruto made a mental note to talk to her when they were alone. Naruto then turned to Apollo. Does this thing have seat belts? Apollo smiled nervously. Well you see I've never really needed them before so no it doesn't. After a bumpy ride Talia had crashed into the Camp Half-Blood Canoe Lake. The bus bobbed to the surface, along with a couple of capsized, half-melted canoes. Well, Apollo said with a brave smile. That went well don't ya think? Let's go see if we boiled anyone important, shall we? The camp was not what Naruto had expected. He thought they would be preparing for an all-out war but it just looked like a summer camp for kids on steroids. It was covered in snow and the cabins were decorated with tiny flickering lights. Kind of a let down. Whoa, Nico said as the group walked towards the big house. Is that a climbing wall? Yeah, Percy said with a knowing smile. When you've been trained enough you'll get to climb it as well. Naruto snorted as Nico was amazed at the prospect of climbing the lava wall. Everyone looked at him with a ed eyebrow. Naruto sighed before explaining himself. When we arrived at the camp one expected you all to be preparing for this big war coming but instead you're all performing the bare minimum required for any of you to survive the coming battles. That wall and all the other stuff you have here that is supposed to be, top training, is at most a light workout for me. He said calmly while continuing his walk to the big house. Everyone was stumped at the declaration. Their camp was a light warm up. Just what are exactly his training methods? I can tell you one thing, if this is how you train your heroes then neither Nico or Bianca will participate in the coming war. Naruto continued not breaking his stride toward the big house. Most of the group stopped walking except Zoe, but even she faltered a little when he had finished his speech. Percy was floored. How could this guy basically call them weak and forbid his siblings to aid them in the war with Kronos? WW wait a minute you just can't come here and say all of that. We train hard for our skills. We fight for our lives most of the time against bloodthirsty monsters. And you can't just forbid Nico and Bianca from helping us. Percy said after he got over his initial shock. Nico spoke up as well. Yeah Naruto I wanna help them. I wanna fight. Bianca looked on with a worried expression. Then she turned to Naruto. I'm not going to argue with you but why would not allow us to fight alongside the others? Naruto sighed as he slowed to a halt and turned to face the group. When Apollo said that I broke into your dimension he wasn't kidding. Death is the same in all universes. That is why Hades has control over the other realms of death. He feel in love with my mother and had me. My world is in a constant state of war. It's kill or be killed. The only main differences our two worlds have is in mind we can manipulate the elements to such a degree that we created techniques for each element and used them in battle. My world has had four great shinobi world wars. A shinobi is basically a ninja but with the ability to manipulate said elements and use other techniques such as the summoning jutsu. The number of deaths in each war was so high no one even bothered to count. I myself have fought in two smaller wars but they were brutal and grueling. I watched as many people died right beside me. I will not allow Nico or Bianca to be put at that risk because of a lack of serious training. Naruto spoke in a deadly serious voice. It had silenced the entire group. Naruto then turned and started walking to the big house. He didn't even turn his head when he spoke again. Are you coming or not? We do have a meeting to be at. And this seemed to knock everyone out of their horrified stupor and start walking to the big house. 
Zoe's eyes widened slightly then softened a little as Naruto finished his tirade. Maybe I have misjudged this man. He knows the horrors of war and wishes to protect his family even though he has just met them. This will require me to watch him more and gather information, something that I strangely enjoy. She sighed before moving with the rest of the hunters. Naruto sighed before speaking again. If you want I can implement some of my training regiment into your schedules. Not all of it, that would kill most, if not all of you. Naruto offered, this is also open to the hunters if you wish to attend but no one is forcing you. Zoe seemed to think about the offer. On one hand she would have to practically follow orders from a man. But she could also learn of his skills in further detail and his so-called training methods. After a few more minutes she spoke. I will attend to your training session. But don't get any ideas. This surprised everyone except Naruto who merely nodded and continued back towards the big house. A hunter walked next to Zoe and spoke in a whisper. Are you sure we can trust a man? She had said the word man with extreme distaste. Zoe shook her head. No I'm not sure if we can trust him, but if his training can make us stronger then I'm willing to try. As much as I hate to admit it he is right about one thing. People die in war. If his training can increase the hunter's chances to survive then so be it. He spoke of the horrors of war and I could tell he was telling the truth. That is one thing no one can truly lie about. The hunter nodded in understanding. Zoe then spoke to Naruto. Son of Hades, when is the first training session? Naruto thought about it for a few seconds before speaking. Tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. sharp. We all need to rest up and relax before we crack down on training. Zoe nodded her assent to the plan. Annabeth joined the conversation at this point. I'll be there as well but now we need to check in with Chiron. She turned to Zoe. You may want to come as well. Zoe's face darkened. I have met Chiron before. Tell we are using cabin 8. With that the hunters walked up to the cabin. Nico interjected quickly while he had the chance. Who's Chiron? He asked. I don't have his figurine. Our activities director. Percy said continuing where Annabeth had left off. He's, well you'll see. Percy left much to the imagination with that one. If those hunter girls don't like him, Nico grumbled. That's good enough for me. At this both Naruto and Bianca chuckled. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
you're in charge while I'm gone. And then they were gone leaving behind only the smell of grapes. Chiron turned to Nico and Bianca and managed a small smile. Grover could you please take these two to see the orientation film. And we will talk about the hunters when Mr. D and if Naruto return. Orientation film, Nico asked, is it G or PG? Quace Bianca is kinda strict. It's PG-13, Grover interrupted. Cool, Nico shouted happily and followed him out with a grumbling Bianca. Just before they were gone Bianca turned to Chiron. Hey where will we stay since Hades doesn't have a cabin? She questioned. Chiron gave a weary smile and spoke. Your father has taken care of that. As of now we have a Hades cabin. At Mount Olympus, council room. Ten of the twelve Olympian gods were in their seats. Artemis was still on her hunt. Zeus was in the center with an angry scowl covering his face. Dionysus appearing with the subject of the meeting caught everyone's attention. As Dionysus walked towards his seat Naruto looked at his father and walked forward and got on one to bow to Hades. Hades had a small smirk on his face knowing his son hated doing such things even when they were needed. Why are bowing to him boy? It is the entire council that will decide your fate. Zeus said in annoyance. Naruto looked up with a blank face. Well as blank as it could be with his mask on. I pay respect to my father because he has my respect. While I respect each of the gods, I respect him the most for that simple fact. The other gods nodded to this except Zeus. His eyes only seemed to narrow even more. He spoke soon after Naruto had. Tell me why we should spare your life boy. Zeus said mockingly. When Zeus saw he had something to say he motioned for him to speak. Naruto sighed before speaking. The great prophecy does not apply to me because I have already turned 16. And I would appreciate it if you didn't call me boy. I haven't been one for a long time now. Zeus raised an eyebrow. Yes, we heard from your father about the world you are from. I am most interested about what your elements are. We also know of the wars you have fought in even though you weren't a soldier or ninja or whatever it was. Naruto caught that he was ordering him to tell them his elemental abilities. He was headstrong but not stupid so he answered. I am able to use wind, fire, and lightning. Zeus' eyes narrowed and his scowl deepened. Thunder roared outside the council room. And why should I allow you, son of Hades, to use my element? Zeus said in a dangerous whisper. Naruto only reached into his trench soat and activated a storage seal. He pulled out a small scroll and threw it to Zeus who caught with a skeptical look in his eye. Naruto decided to elaborate. Inside that scroll is knowledge on how I discovered black lightning. All the gods' eyes were wide now, even Zeus. What are you talking about? Explain yourself. Zeus all but shouted. Naruto replied in a calm voice despite the situation. When you condense lightning to an extreme degree its power will increase exponentially. A side effect is it turns black, hence the name. The one drawback is it requires an absurd amount of control. There is a technique I created as well in the scroll. It is called the Raiden no Yoroi, or the Lightning Armor. It covers the user's body in lightning, protecting it as well as increasing the user's speed and strength greatly. The gods were surprised that a mortal had accomplished such a feat. Zeus now had a neutral look on his face. And you offer these as gifts to me in exchange for your life? He asked with an expressionless face. Naruto had a similar look in his eyes. Well I was also hoping for your blessing. I guess I have to pull out the big guns then. He said as he went back to the seal in his coat. All the gods were surprised by his boldness. Zeus only raised a skeptical eyebrow. Naruto pulled out what looked like a sword hilt. When he held up the hilt all of the Olympians looked skeptical except Hephaestus whose eyes had widened. You offer a broken blade. Is this a joke mortal? Zeus said with slight annoyance. Naruto sighed. No. This blade is made of pure lightning. When you channel your energy into it the blade will come out. To prove this he demonstrated it. When the lightning sprung from the hilt everyone was impressed. Even Hephaestus, who decided to voice his approval. Amazing craftsmanship. Did you make this? He asked clearly impressed with the blade. No, it was made by the Nadaim Hokage of Kanahagakur. He specialized in water manipulation. He was even able to pull water molecules out of the air and ride a tsunami into battle. He forged the blade with a fuinjutsu specialist so it would cover his weakness against lightning. Naruto explained. Zeus eyed the blade critically for a few moments before speaking again. 
Very well, I approve. You have my blessing to use my element in battle. Your gifts are appreciated. This meeting is over. Everyone was surprised by Zeus' verdict but went back to their jobs nonetheless. Dionysus walked over to Naruto with a raised eyebrow. Well, not what I was expecting but it'll have to do. Come on let's go. He touched Naruto's shoulder and they were off. Camp Half-Blood, Big House. Chiron looked up from his book as Naruto and Dionysus appeared inside the big house. Well since you're not dead I can only assume the meeting went well then Naruto. The centaur asked sincerely. Naruto nodded and started to head towards wherever Nico and Bianca were. Chiron seemed to sense this as he spoke again. They are watching our orientation film. I doubt you would need to watch it so you don't have to. But something you should know is that your father had a cabin built for you three so that is where you all shall be staying. Naruto nodded again before asking Chiron something. Would it be possible for me to use the forges or is it strictly for Hephaestus' children? I have been working on a new blade but it is still not finished. I could probably complete it in a few days if I had the proper equipment. Naruto mused on the last part more to himself. Chiron seemed to think about it for a few seconds before answering. It should be all right but you should clear it with the head camper for that cabin, which is Charles Beckendorf. There is also the annual capture the flag game we hold with the hunters every time they visit. It will be the whole camp against them, or those that wish to participate anyway. It will be in three days, he mentioned. Secretly he was hoping Naruto would be the edge that would allow them to finally beat the hunters. Naruto turned back towards the door and started to WLAK out. I will join in the game but Nico and Bianca will watch with you. They have yet to be trained and would only get in the way on this occasion. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go talk to this Beckendorf fellow. Oh, and by the way, I am hosting a training session tomorrow at 5 am, if you wish to come and join then you are welcome but you don't have to. We will need a medic, Naruto said as he disappeared heading in the direction of the Hephaestus cabin. Chiron turned to Mr. D and spoke seriously. That lad is going to aid us greatly in the coming war. Dionysus didn't say anything for a moment. Then he sighed. Yes he will, unfortunately. He added in a semi-bitter undertone. Chiron smirked when he heard the gods reply. Do you really dislike him that much or is it the fact that he beat you six games in a row at Pinnacle? The wine god only narrowed his eyes and cursed in ancient Greek. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
As long as they train seriously they are welcome. To that Percy's attitude seemed to perk up a bit. Beckendorf overheard them and spoke out as well. Hey Naruto, Hephaestus' cabin is welcome to I hope. He had shouted over everyone and now all eyes were on Naruto. Yes you guys can come. It's not private anyone is welcome. Naruto said to everyone. Dinner was as normal as it could be with the hunters glaring at the Ares cabin and them blaring right back. Naruto spoke more with what Nico and Bianca on their lives and their interests. They asked him similar questions and also asked him about where he was from. When they went to bed Naruto had all in all had a pretty good day. He closed his eyes and let blissful unconsciousness take hold of him. The next morning, everyone had woke up early for Naruto's training session, even the Ares cabin. The Aphrodite cabin was over to the side commenting on how everyone looked. Chiron was leading the group with the hunters and Percy's group not far behind. When they arrived at the location they were told to come to they saw an army of Naruto's fighting one Naruto. Blades were drawn and the battle raged. The sight bewildered them all. Then suddenly a black fox the size of a horse with two tails landed in front of the group. Startled everyone drew their weapons, hunters armed their bows and were prepared to fire when a voice stopped them. It was the Naruto fighting the entire army of himself. Stop. He is my summon. He will not attack unless attacked. Naruto shouted not stopping in his slaughter the entire time. Everyone was starting to ask questions when a voice stopped them. Geez, can't you humans be a little relaxed? You act like you all got your panties in a wad. The looked around to see the horse-sized fox had spoken. Even Chiron was surprised. Zoe was the one who vocalized her confusion though. Wait a minute, how are you able to talk? And how and why is he fighting an army of himself? The fox just chuckled. Calm yourself. That is one of my summoner's abilities. He can make a near infinite number of solid clones. And as for me, I'm his family. When a shinobi from his world signs a summoning contract and passes the test they receive a family. That is a summon that is directly linked to their summoner. My name is Kinjo. Kinjo explained to the group. Chiron and some of the others nodded in understanding as they had heard some of this from Naruto before, but most were still confused. Such as Clarice who was more vocal in her thoughts. Hey hold up Fox, what do you mean, his world? She asked the unasked question of many, one of which was Beckendorf. The Fox just sighed before answering. Well I'm sure you all heard about the ruckus that happened on Mount Olympus about two days ago, right? When everyone nodded he continued. Well that was Naruto coming into this dimension. Death is the same in some worlds parallel to this one so Hades also rules death in those places. He fell in love with Naruto's mother in our world. There this kind of thing is common, well not fighting an army of yourself but people are able to manipulate the elements and summon creatures into battle, such as myself. Naruto signed the Kitsune summoning contract and is able to call us into battle. He came here because he held no true love for his birthplace and wished to move on. If you wish to know more then you must ask him yourself. Though I will tell that our world is extremely warlike. He participated in two already and he's only 17. The fox had laid down and was watching his summoner eliminate the remaining clones. Everyone who had not heard the story was shocked to say the least. They had a super-powered ninja here to help them. Many had gained a great respect for him such as Beckendorf and Clarice. Naruto walked over he only had on his black face mask and his black cargo pants with his combat boots. No shirt. This had a lot of the female populace staring at him hungrily. Zoe was looking for an entirely different reason. She had seen his scars. There were multiple cuts all over but the biggest thing was a straight cut from the top of his right shoulder to his right thigh. It looked like it went past but Zoe couldn't tell because of his pants. She silently wished he would remove them, then she blushed realizing what she had just thought. Stop this. You are a hunter. I do not need fickle things such as men. They have only betrayed me in the past. She thought sternly then glumly at the end. As Naruto reached them he spoke. Well this is quite a turn out. If you are training then form a line to receive your gear. He spoke to everyone. Only the Aphrodite cabin and some Apollo and Dionysus kids went to the side lines with Chiron. Naruto then handed everyone a couple of weights. Seeing everyone's confusion he clarified things. Listen up. You have two arm weights, and two leg weights. I can directly control the weight with the seals placed on them. 
Each weight will start at 30 pounds each. We will gradually move up when I think it is time. Brace yourselves. He warned only getting looks of confusion. Naruto made the ram seal and channeled chakra into the weights. Nearly everyone hit the ground due to the unexpected increase. Only Percy and Zoe remained standing and they looked to be doing it on sheer willpower. All right get yourselves up. When you can stand properly again you will do 50 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, 50 pull-ups using branches, and finally you will do 5 laps around the camp. Each day we will increase the number and add more things as we go along. So that being said is there anyone who wants to stop right now? If you don't you are obligated to finish the course through the end. Naruto asked seriously. Nobody moved. Well they couldn't anyway but no one protested to his rules. Naruto nodded his approval. Very well. Let's begin. This continued the whole day minus lunch and chore breaks. Finally it was dinner time and Naruto told them it was time to head back. Naruto walked back to the dinner pavilion with Kairin. The centaur was impressed with the shinobi's training regiment. Well that was impressive Naruto. I may just have to make that mandatory now. It's already showing results. They can now successfully walk like a normal person and act as they regularly do with 120 pounds added onto them. And the weight will continuously grow so they never grow familiar with one specific weight. Naruto nodded to the praise. He then turned to the grumbling and sore group behind them. Hey listen up. Tomorrow I'm doubling your weights. Enjoy. He said with a small chuckle. Everyone groaned in protest. Chiron laughed a little at that. Then he spoke to the group. Well let's go and enjoy a nice relaxing dinner. The group seemed to brighten up at that. Over the next two days the process repeated itself. Wake up, train, eat lunch, train some more, activities, dinner, free time, sleep. Naruto had clones finishing his blade while he was busy with training everyone. It was finished right before capture the flag. Naruto had given them light training since they had that to worry about. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Chiron was back in his wheelchair and sat at one end of the table with Dionysus. Zoe and another hunter took the other end. Talia, Grover, Annabeth, and Percy were seated on the right side of the table, and the other head counselors Beckendorf, Selina Beauregard, and the Stoll brothers sat on the left. The Ares kids were all suffering from broken limbs, which happened to be an accident on the hunter's part. Naruto leaned against a wall because he couldn't sit down with his new blade and he didn't want to take it off. The sword itself looked like a giant katana, but it was a foot wide and as tall as Naruto making it a behemoth of a blade. Naruto had forged it so it could break into seven different blades. He called it the Buster Blade. Zoe started the meeting off on a positive note. This is pointless, she said flatly before glaring at Naruto who only raised an eyebrow in response. Cheese whiz. Grover almost squelled. He began scooping up the crackers and ping pong balls and spraying them with topping. This is no time for talk, Zoe said, pushing her point. Our goddess needs us. The hunters must leave immediately. And go where? Chiron asked calmly. West, Zoe said. You heard the prophecy. Six shall go west to the goddess in chains. We can get five hunters and go. She argued. Artemis is being held hostage. We must find her and free her. Naruto put a stop to that idea quickly. First off, aren't quests supposed to be taken by those they are given to? Secondly, it also said both campers and hunters, meaning a group with some of each. And thirdly, acting rashly will only get you and your fellow hunters killed as well as putting Artemis in a worse position. So put on the brakes for a minute, okay? Naruto didn't raise his voice once. To Zoe he was mocking her with that damned calm voice of his. Talia smirked as she heard the hunter being put in her place. No, Zoe was starting to see red. The hunters do not need thy help. Your, Talia corrected. Nobody has said thy in, like, 300 years, Zoe. Get with the times. Talia was having fun mocking her. Before Zoe could retort Naruto cut into the conversation. Besides, no one said you had a choice in it. Either you fall in line or I can take another hunter while you stay here. I don't need anyone being put into unneeded risk. Especially when we have some possible deaths on our hands. So what is your choice? Naruto put on his war eyes. They were hardened by war and unjustified hatred. Zoe nearly flinched at the amount of anger and sadness in his eyes. Reluctantly she nodded her head in agreement. Mr. D felt the need to speak some dreary thoughts of his. One shall perish. That sounds rather nasty, doesn't it? What if you fail because you try to cooperate? He asked making them all think. Chiron sighed. Mr. D with all respect, whose side are you on? The centaur groaned. Dionysus raised his eyebrows. Sorry my dear centaur, just trying to be helpful. Naruto almost chuckled at that. He seemed to be anything but helpful. We're supposed to work together. Talia said stubbornly. I don't like it either. Zoe, but you know prophecies. I don't fell like fighting one. Zoe grimaced but Percy could tell Talia had scored a point. We must not delay, Chiron warned. Today is Sunday. This Friday, December 21st, is the winter solstice. Oh joy, Dionysus muttered. Another dull annual meeting. Artemis must been present at the solstice. Zoe said catching on to what Chiron was saying. She has been one of the most vocal on the council arguing for action against Kronos's minions. If she is absent, the gods will decide nothing. We will lose another year of war preparations. Are you suggesting that the gods have trouble acting together, young lady? Dionysus asked. Yes, Lord Dionysus. Zoe didn't hesitate in answering. Naruto smirked at her boldness. Mr. D nodded. Just checking. You're right of course. Carry on. I must agree with Zoe. Chiron said, Artemis's presence at the Winter Council is critical. Even with Lord Hades on our side now it will be nearly impossible. Now we must decide who goes on this quest. Naruto since you were given the quest you may choose who we'll go. He turned to stage over to Naruto who thought about his options. There was no way in hell he was taking Nico or Bianca. I want Percy, Grover, Talia, Zoe and she can pick another hunter to bring. He said making his choices. Zoe nodded and spoke right away knowing her choice. I wish to take Phoebe. She will act as our medic and long-range fighter. Naruto nodded and started to walk out of the big house when Percy stopped him. Wait, 
Where are you going? Percy asked. He was confused. They never left until Chiron or Mr. D told them they could leave. I'm going to pack my things for this quest. And then I'm saying goodbye to Nico and Bianca. Chiron, you have my training schedule. Keep the camp on it, okay? Chiron nodded and Naruto left. There could be deaths on this quest, one of which could be killed by their parent. Chiron said gravely. That sobered up the mood real quick and everyone was quiet. Oh, goody, Dionysus exclaimed. Everyone looked at him. He glanced up innocently from the pages of his wine connoisseur magazine. Ah, Pinot Noir is making a comeback. Don't mind me. Everyone had a twitch on their heads and they heard Naruto laugh, seemingly he had heard Dionysus. Travis Stroll turned to Zoe and spoke cautiously. The big girl who likes to hit people on the head is the one you're taking right. Zoe nodded. The one who put arrows in my helmet? Connor Stroll asked. Yes. Zoe snapped. What of it? She asked venomously. Oh nothing. Travis said all too sweetly. Just that we have a t-shirt for her from the camp store. He held up a big silver t-shirt that said. Artemis the Moon Goddess, Fall Hunting Tour 2002, with a huge list of national parks and stuff underneath. It's a collector's item. She was admiring it. You want to give it to her. And the trap was set. Everyone who knew the Stoll brothers knew something was up. But Zoe didn't know them as well. She sighed and took the shirt. All right everyone is dismissed. Time to go to bed. We will need the rest. Chiron said. Percy turned to Annabeth and noticed she had a crestfallen look on her face. He nudged her as they walked out of the big house, getting her attention. What's got you so down? He asked. Annabeth just sighed. Nothing. I just wanted to go on this quest with you guys. I'll be there to see you off in the morning. Percy nodded. There wasn't anything he could do. Naruto was leading this quest and he knew what he was doing when it came to combat. Nobayadi slept all that well that night. Nico nearly bawled when he found out Naruto was leaving them to go on a dangerous quest, even if it was only for a little under a week. Bianca was disappointed but didn't let it show. She just wanted to spend time with her new family. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He is Atlas, the strongest titan in Kronos's army. And he's my father. She whispered the last part as tears rolled found her face. Naruto's eyes widened and he pulled Zoe into a hug and held her behind the gas station while she cried. When she had calmed down after a few minutes he spoke. I don't judge you on who your parents are. The one I have the chance of saving, it's you, isn't it? I'll make sure you make it back. Artemis is in trouble and I'll help you get her back, even if it costs me my life. That's a promise on the river Styx. He spoke resolutely. Zoe's bloodshot eyes widened and she blushed. I was wrong. He does care. He even promised on the river Styx. Maybe I can find out what true love is. She thought hopefully. She hugged him back which surprised the shinobi. But as quickly as she had, she let go and started walking back to the group. He heard her speak one last time before she rounded the corner. Do not betray my trust. It will be the last thing you do. I promise that Naruto. She remembered her past experience. Thank you, Naruto. Naruto only smiled and walked back as well. Maybe he could get used to this world. Naruto and Zoe had come back to Percy, Annabeth, and Talia all looking unsurely at Grover. Zoe watched with an impassive face. Naruto figured she didn't want to seem weak or soft-hearted because of the moment they had earlier. Naruto raised an eyebrow when he heard the next part of the conversation. And you did this with acorns? Talia asked questioningly. She had a, like hell you can make me believe that, look on her face. Grover looked offended before he retorted indignantly. It's a time-honored tracking spell. I mean, I'm pretty sure I did it right. He said the last part with dwindling bravado. Naruto shook his head silently at that. DC is about 60 miles from here. Annabeth said. Naruto nodded in agreement. You're right. Nico and Bianca told me they used to live there. Zoe chose this moment to finally speak her mind. I dislike this. We should go straight west. The prophecy said west. She was eager to save Artemis. That much was obvious to everyone. Oh like your tracking skills are any better. Talia growled. Naruto's brow creased a little. He needed to figure out why those two seemed to hate each other. Zoe stepped towards her with a scowl on her face. You challenge my skills, you scullion. You know nothing of being a hunter. Oh, scullion, you're calling me a scullion. What the heck is a scullion? Talia wasn't backing down. Naruto was about to intervene when Grover spoke up. Whoa, you too. He started with what sounded like a stern voice that had been severely watered down. Come on, not again. Naruto did speak this time. Grover's right. DC is our best shot at a solid lead right now. Talia, stop starting arguments just because you don't agree with her lifestyle. Zoe stopped taunting her. That makes you as childish as her and it doesn't do a thing to help Artemis. Now let's go. I'm driving by the way Zoe. I don't need us crashing just because you and Talia were at each other's throats. Naruto mediated the situation well. And to everyone's surprise, Zoe handed over the keys and calmed down. Talia's eyes widened. Oh my gods. Miss Hunter has a crush on Naruto. I can't blame her either. Look at those muscles. She thought dreamily. When everyone loaded into the van Naruto put in a CD and attack by 30 seconds to Mars. They looked at him with deadpan faces. He shrugged before I smiling. What can I say? They make some good music. After we leave DC. My father told me to stop at Memphis to meet up with an old friend of mine. I don't know who it is but all of my friends could kill you in a 36 different ways with their hands. He had the same eye smile on as the others were shocked out of their minds. He absentmindedly beckoned to hum the song as they headed for the nation's capital. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
One of them walked off towards the Museum of Natural History. The entrance was closed off to the public but Naruto only bypassed it and walked in, following Dr. Thorne. Zoe looked at the other Naruto who answered her unasked question in a whisper. I'm a clone, the boss was following the manticore who was at Westover Hall. He didn't want to draw attention so he could gather more information on who's been following us. Zoe had a surprised look on her face but she quickly calmed her features. She understood the silent command of, don't say anything to the others. She silently followed the others. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The hunter will be difficult to dispose of. Luke said to Atlas. Zoe Nightshade. Do not speak her name. The general shouted. Luke swallowed and spoke with a slight stutter. S sorry general. I just. Atlas raised his hand and silenced him. Let me show you, my boy, how we will bring down that hunter. He pointed to the guy on the ground level. Do you have the teeth? The guy stumbled forward with a ceramic pot. Yes, general. Plant them, he said. The guard placed sharp white teeth into the soil. He smoothed them over while the general smiled coldly. The guard stepped back from the dirt and wiped his hands. Ready, general. Excellent. Wake them, and we will let them scent their prey. Naruto didn't like the sound of before he could do anything the soil started to bubble. Soon, I will show you, Luke, soldiers that will make your army from that little boat look insignificant. Luke clenched his fists. The soil erupted. Naruto stepped back slightly nervous. For each tooth a creature was struggling out of the dirt. The first of them said, Mew. It was a kitten, a little orange tabby with stripes like a tiger. Then a dozen appeared and started to roll around and play with each other. Naruto would have laughed his ass off but couldn't blow his cover. He decided to take one of them and keep it as a pet. A very viscous and violent pet. He recognized them as saber-toothed tigers. They'd make guard dogs. Plus they were orange. While he didn't wear it as part of his ninja gear he still loved the color. The general roared in disbelief. What is this? Cute cuddly kittens. Where did you find Thu's teeth? He focused his anger on the guard. From the exhibit, sir. Just like you said. The saber-toothed tigers. No you idiot. I said Tyrannosaurus. Gather up those, infernal fuzzy little beast and take them outside. And never let me see your face again. The terrified guard was so scared he didn't notice the two missing baby saber tooths. After they had gathered the correct teeth they restarted the ritual. A skeletal hand shot out of the dirt followed by many more. Quickly, give them the scent. They must smell their prey first. As he said that, skeletons erupted from the ground. There were twelve of them, one for each tooth that had been planted. They were growing flesh and turning into men. But they had gray skin, yellow eyes, and modern clothes gray muscle shirts, camo pants, and combat boots. Their skin looked transparent and their bones shimmered. One looked right at Naruto and he knew he had been spotted. He narrowed his eyes and stared right back, while silently working on an escape plan. They released a scarf that looked familiar to Naruto. His eyes widened as he realized it was Zoe's. He put both of the saber-tooth cubs on his shoulders and rushed to get the scarf. He got it in time but the warriors had caught his scent. Naruto rushed out and headed for the others. As he left he heard the screams of furry from Atlas. Naruto tore through the mall heading to the museum. He dropped his jutsu and made a few clones to pick up the other saber-tooth cubs when the enemy guards weren't paying attention. As soon as he made it through admissions he started a desperate search for the others. The main part of the museum was one huge room with rockets and airplanes hanging from the ceiling. Three levels of balconies curled around as well. The place wasn't crowded, just a few families and a couple of tourists. Naruto really wanted them to leave before shit hit the fan, but he figured that would only get him arrested. Any minute those skeleton soldiers were going to invade the museum. In his hurried search Naruto made a quick turn and ran over Zoe, literally. They had both fallen to the floor with Naruto on top. As Naruto regained his bearings he felt something warm and soft on his lips through his mask. When his sight cleared he saw he was Frenching Zoe and she had both eyes glaring murderously at him. Her face was cherry red when she pushed him off. Talia was laughing her ass off while Grover, Annabeth, and Percy were wide-eyed at what had happened. Zoe then drew her bow and loaded an arrow in it. Thy shall pay for stealing my first kiss. She was giving a glare that could kill and her face was cherry red from either embarrassment or anger. Talia burst out laughing again. TT that W was your F first kiss. She asked while she held her sides. The others couldn't contain themselves anymore and all of them started laughing, except Naruto. Zoe had aimed her arrow a wee bit too close to mini Naruto. None of them had noticed the museum was cleared out except for them. Zoe went even redder in the face because of Talia's comment. Percy noticed something orange on Naruto's shoulders. Um, Naruto, what's on your shoulders? He asked curiously. 
Zoe lowered her bow slightly as she too noticed the small orange balls of fur currently located on the blonde's shoulders. Then they both uncurled and let out a noise none of them expected to hear. Meow. It was a pair of tiny cats with tiny fangs. Zoe, Annabeth and Talia were resisting the urge to skeeze the life out of them, while Percy and Grover had confused looks on their faces. A roar alerted them and they all got into their battle stances. Naruto turned to them. I'll explain everything later but now we need to take care of this thing and get out of here. Everyone nodded their assent to the plan. Something enormous bounded up the ramp. It was the sixie of a pickup truck, with silver claws and golden glittering fur. The Nemean lion, Talia said, don't move. The lion roared so loud it parted Percy's hair. Its fangs gleamed like stainless steel. Separate on my mark, Zoe said in a calm voice but her eyes betrayed her as they looked ready to kill. Probably due to the incident just a few seconds ago. Try to keep it distracted. Until when? Grover asked as he started to shake in fear. Until I think of a way to kill it. Go, she said in irritation. Naruto chuckled at what she said as he broke off from the group. Zoe rounded on him momentarily with a fire in her eyes. Quiet, you're on thin ice, son of Hades. Naruto shut up real quick and saluted like the smart ass he was. Despite the situation everyone laughed a little. Percy uncapped Riptide and rolled left. Arrows whistled past Naruto and Percy as they moved forward to get the beast's attention. Grover stayed back and started playing on his reed pipes. The arrows stopped while Zoe started climbing the Apollo capsule. All of the arrows she had fired only bounced of the lion's metallic fur. The lion swiped at the capsule and knocked Zoe off of it. Grover's song started turning frantic when the lion turned towards him but Talia stepped in its path and held up her shield, Aegis. The effect was instantaneous, the Nemean lion recoiled. Ruar. Back. Talia yelled as she started pushing forward. The lion growled and clawed at the air, but it retreated as if the shield were a blazing fire. Naruto saw this and quickly shouted his plan. Talia keep pushing it back. Annabeth stay with her. Percy you're with me, we're gonna keep it still while Zoe hits it in the mouth. Grover cover Zoe, everyone clear. A resounding yes was his response and they went to work. As Naruto jumped on its back Percy slid under and held its paws Swa couldn't strike him. Now Zoe, Naruto shouted, and the hunter fired what could only be described as, the prefect shot. The arrow found its mark and the beast went up in a golden dust. A fur coat was left on top of Percy. When he tried to hand it to Naruto the blonde shinobi declined. No, you held its arms so it couldn't strike away the arrow. You earned it. Strangely enough Zoe agreed with him. The group left just as the skeleton warriors arrived. Outskirts of the city of Memphis. Naruto had told them the info he had acquired during his spying on the long drive to the birthplace of rock and roll. Zoe turned pale when he mentioned the general and Percy had a look of hate in his eyes when Naruto spoke of Luke. They were surprised that Naruto had taken all of the saber-tooth cubs. Said cubs were in the back being played with by Annabeth and Grover. They were just going to die if I left them and besides they're orange. He said as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. This got several confused looks and Zoe raised her eyebrow. Naruto just sighed. Orange is my signature color. You wouldn't catch me dead without it. Annabeth pointed out what seemed to be obvious. But you're not wearing orange now. As a response he just flashed the inside of his sleeveless trench coat and it had orange stripes. Like I said, you won't catch me without my orange. Zoe had an amused smile on her face while the others were wondering how they missied that. Anyway my dad told me to head to a bar called The Raven. I'll meet my contact there and then we'll catch a train heading to San Francisco. Nobody complained so he just kept driving. When he found the place he was looking for he pulled EDD into a parking space and everyone walked in. It had a slight haze that drifted at the ceiling and several TVs with games on. Nobody was there though. Naruto looked at the bartender and his eyes widened. He walked over there and spoke to the man. It's been a while Itachi. How have you been? The others finally got a good look at the man who was supposed to be good friends with Naruto. He had long raven black hair tied in a ponytail and coal black eyes. His face had no scars but had a hardened look about it. He was skinny but had a nice amount of muscle for someone his size. 
The man smiled when he saw Naruto and put away the glasses he had been cleaning. Not bad, Naruto-kun. Yourself? He asked calmly in a monotone voice. Naruto gave him a smile and spoke. Oh, not bad. Meet a few gods here, kill some monsters there. I didn't expect you to be my contact. Naruto spoke to him as if he was an old friend. And honestly, he was. Zoe and the others were slightly uncomfortable with the smoky atmosphere. Itachi noticed and turned on the fans. Well, I had a disease that couldn't be cured in our world so Lord Hades saw an opportunity. He brought me here and cured me, in exchange I have to help you whenever I can. Luckily he supplied me with Stygian iron weapons so I won't just be limited to my ninja techniques. Naruto nodded and spoke solemnly. Sorry you had to leave your family. How's the old man doing? Itachi laughed slightly at Naruto's nickname for the Sandame. Actually he was also brought over to head the defense of that camp of yours. He was given a younger age, around 40 I think, and was placed as the defensive leader of Camp Half-Blood. He can still summon his monkey allies so that helps too. The other's gods were slightly adamant about letting a mortal in that position, but when they saw why Lord Hades chose him they allowed it. But your father asked me to aid you in this quest so as soon as I get changed we'll go. Zoe's eyes widened and she spoke quickly. Wait the quest said Six will go west to free the Lady Artemis. You cannot come or it could possibly ruin our chances. Naruto and Itachi chuckled at what she said. It only infuriated her. Naruto saw this and spoke placatingly while Itachi went to get changed. Calm down. He's not going to free Artemis. He's going to help us get there. So everything's cool. Let's enjoy some rum before we have to leave all right. As Naruto broke into Itachi's rum stash they heard Itachi yell downstairs. You're paying me back for that rum Naruto. Naruto grumbled but drank anyway. The others were confused by this and Zoe spoke. Is it not against the law for minors to drink alcohol? She asked with her arms crossed and her eyebrow raised. Naruto started to sweat. Itachi saw this as he came down and muttered, whipped. Naruto then came up with an excuse. Well where we're from we are considered adults and allowed to drink and such. Allowed to kill, allowed to drink, as they say. Zoe still had a skeptical look on her face but relented. Fine, but I'm driving. Naruto knew he wasn't going to win so he just gave her the keys. As the loaded into the van Percy and the other started asking questions. Naruto was getting a few extra bottles of rum sealed in his trench coat. So who is this, old man, Naruto mentioned earlier. Annabeth asked. Itachi chuckled and spoke with a mirthful tone. Well he was the Sandame, or the third Hokage of the village hidden in the leaves. Well he was the Sandame, or the third Hokage of the village hidden in the leaves. Itachi started. To be Hokage means you are the strongest in the village and you are willing to sacrifice your life for the safety of the village. They act as a dictator with a council that can limit his or her power in controlling the village. The same practice is carried throughout the entire shinobi world. Here is in Serutobi, or in Naruto's words, the old man, was the third leader of Kanahagakur. He paused letting the demigods and Zoe absorb what they had learned so far. When they looked for him to continue Naruto cut him off as he was performing the, Kuchio's no jutsu, or summoning jutsu. The old man has lived through all four great shinobi wars and fought in the last three. He is a master strategist and even more feared for his ability on the battlefield. He coined the nickname, the God of Shinobi, or, the Professor. Both make reference to his mastery of 1000 Jutsu. Percy cut him off before he could continue. Wait, that's why he was feared. Because he knew a thousand Jutsu. That sounds impressive for the Professor title but to be called a God. Percy stopped, not needing to say more. The others nodded their heads as they agreed with his assessment. This made both shinobi chuckle at their naiveness. Itachi though took over after casting a glare at Naruto for interrupting him. Said blonde was giving the saber tooth cubs to his summon to take back to the camp. He looked sickeningly innocent as he did so. Tell me when a person masters a skill they are better at it than anyone else aside from fellow masters, right? They all accepted the logic. Well if a jutsu that has been mastered goes against the same jutsu that isn't, who do you think will win? Their eyes widened as they realized what he was talking about. Zoe couldn't help but be further impressed by the warriors from Naruto's world. 
Itachi chuckled at their expressions as did Naruto after he had sent his summon along. You get it now don't you? He was famous for his skills and devotion to the ninja arts. All right enough gossip ladies, let's move. Naruto said as he got into the shotgun seat. When they hit downtown traffic they slowed considerably and Percy noticed a sleek, black military style helicopter. They know the van, he said drawing everyone's attention. That's the same type of helicopter that was at Westover Hall. We have to ditch it. Zoe swerved into the fast lane. The helicopter was gaining on them faster than traffic was moving. Maybe the military will shoot it down. Grover said hopefully. Itachi narrowed his eyes and started to mentally prepare himself for a fight. The military probably thinks it's one of theirs Grover. Naruto said as he was getting ready for battle as well. Annabeth asked a question at what was probably the worst time possible. How can the general use mortals anyway? Zoe stiffened slightly at the mention of his title but answered her nonetheless. Mercenaries, Zoe said bitterly. Naruto and Itachi almost flinched at her tone. They were technically mercenaries after all. It is distasteful, but many mortals will fight for any cause as long as they are paid. But don't these mortals see what they're doing and who they're working for? Percy asked. Don't they notice all of the monsters around them? Zoe shook her head. I do not know how much they see through the mist. I doubt it would matter to them if they knew the truth. So M times mortals can be more horrible than monsters. Naruto and Itachi nodded grimly at the sad truth while the others frowned. The helicopter kept getting closer. Talia looked to the clouds and closed her eyes. Hey, Dad, a lighting bolt would be nice about now. Please. Sadly nothing happened. No easy way out this time. Or any other time for that matter. There. Naruto said. The parking lot. We'll be trapped. Zoe said. I can make us an exit and we need to lose the van anyway. Zoe shot across two lanes of traffic and into a mall parking lot on the south bank of the Mississippi River. They left the van and went down some steps. Come on there's a subway tunnel right here. They all followed, not like they really had any other options. As they all boarded the train after they bought tickets the train took off. They looked out the window to see the helicopter circling the parking lot. Percy and the others let out a breath of relief while Naruto and Itachi stopped preparing to fight. Nice job, Naruto, thinking of the subway. Grover said. Naruto just shrugged and replied. Well I would have made an exit if there wasn't a way out anyway. Everyone just sweat dropped at the claim except Itachi and Zoe. The former had a deadpan stare on his face while Zoe's right eye was twitching. The sound of the helicopter grew louder and was getting louder. This put everyone on edge. They changed trains twice and rode for half an hour but finally they lost the helicopter. Unfortunately, when they got off they were in the industrial part of the city with nothing but warehouses and railway tracks. And mud, lots of mud, it seemed to get colder there and the mud didn't help. The others had a slight shiver except for Naruo, Itachi, and Percy. The first two had trains so they were able to endure the harsh weather. While Percy had on his lion coat. They wandered through the railway yard as Naruto and Itachi took up guard duty. All they had found was freight cars after freight cars, most of which were covered in dirt and mud. A homeless guy was standing at a trash can fire. Naruto and Itachi sensed something was strange about the man but not a bad strange. They decided to let the situation play out before alerting the others. He gave them a toothless grin and spoke. Y'all need to get warmed up. Come on over. Everyone but the shinobis rushed towards it and huddled around. Talia's teeth chattered as she spoke. Well this is ggg great. She said sarcastically. My hooves are freezing. Grover complained. Feet. Percy corrected for the sake of the homeless guy. Maybe we should contact camp. Annabeth said. Chiron. No. Zoe said resolutely. They cannot help us anymore. We must finish this quest ourselves. Naruto nodded in agreement. The mood went depressing real quickly. Artemis was in chains and a doomsday monster was on the loose. And they were stuck in Memphis sharing a fire with a homeless person. You know, the homeless man started. You're never completely without friends. His face was grimy and his beard was tangled, but his expression seemed kindly. You kids need a train going west. Yes sir, Naruto said. You know of any. He pointed one greasy hand. They all looked at a freight train gleaming and free of mud or dirt. 
It was an automobile carring trains with steel mesh curtains and a triple deck of cars inside. They had all surprisingly missed it. The side said Sun West Lime. That's convenient, Talia said. Thanks, uh. They turned to see that the homeless guy was gone. The trash can that had been on fire was cold and empty. As if he'd taken the flames with him. As the others boarded the train Naruto turned back and nodded his head to Apollo. He knew it was the sun god after the little appearing act with the train and the fire. Train. After it had left the station everyone had picked a car to sleep in. Naruto chose to sit on the roof of the 1969 Chevy Camaro that Itachi was sleeping in. He saw that Apollo had stopped by to talk to Percy and when he was done he appeared next to Naruto. Yo Mr. Ninja, how's it hanging? He asked casually. He was reading the Ika Ika book Naruto had given him. Said blonde shrugged in response. Not bad. Zoe's been less than a pain than I thought she would be. Apollo chuckled at that. Well I may not be the god of love, but I know when someone is crushing one someone else and vice versa. Naruto was so shocked he didn't respond for a few seconds. How could you tell? He asked in a mere whisper. The immortal being seemed to have no problems hearing him though. She's had about as rough a past as one could have. Almost as bad as yours was. She was betrayed by the first person she trusted and supposedly loved. Now she's opening up to you of all people. My sister will notice ya know. He asked never taking his eyes off the book. I'll just burn that bridge when I come to it. Both chuckled at the joke. I have a favor to ask. He continued when Naruto nodded. Save my sister. You of all people know how important family is. Those damn rules keep me from getting involved so I'm trusting you. No problem. I'll bring Artemis back. Apollo turned the page before asking his last question. So, you got the next book yet? Naruto didn't get much sleep that night but when they arrived at their stop he woke them all up. Percy. Naruto said. It's morning. The train stopped. Come on. As he woke up groggily to Leah, Zoe, and Annabeth had rolled up the metal curtains. Outside were snowy mountains dotted with pine trees, the sun was rising between the two peaks. Naruto knew of Percy's nightly visions as he had seen the boy squirm and talk in his sleep. He saw Percy looking at his pen blade. He decided not to say anything about as it wasn't his business. They had arrived at Cloudcroft, New Mexico. The air was cold and thin. Tall pine trees loomed over the valley casting pitch black shadows. Even Naruto and Itachi were shivering slightly at the temperature. Percy had told them Apollo said to seek out Nerus in San Francisco so they could get answers. Grover wanted some coffee and quickly pointed out the nearest shop. Yes, Zoe said, coffee is good, and pastries, Grover said dreamily. And wax paper. You two go get us some food then. Itachi and I'll check and see if we can't find a ride. Naruto said. Then he turned to the others. And you guys, don't cause too much property damage. They looked indignant as he and Itachi headed off. Zoe laughed at his joke and went to work on getting food. Naruto and Itachi came to what looked like a church and felt something drawing them inside. Curious, they went in. And boy were they surprised. A stereotypical black preacher was ranting but stopped when they came in. He pointed at Naruto and shouted. You sir, what is your name? Naruto Uzumaki. The man just smiled. Come brother Uzumaki let us introduce you to the art of preaching. Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face. Zoe and Grover had stopped to pick up Naruto and Itachi before they went to the others. When they went inside the church they saw Naruto deliberating with what looked like a tribunal of judges. How they had a court session in a church we'll never know. Mr. Uzumaki, is it true that you were responsible for causing people to flee a train, train station, and town due to panic and fear during the DC incident? Questioned the chairman. Naruto paused momentarily before giving a saucy wink causing many of the women to blush. I plead da fif. There was some grumbling at the response, but judge number one plowed on ahead. Can you tell us about the reported giant explosion that nearly destroyed a train? Um, no, 
but I can tell you I plead the fizz IFF. Naruto responded with a grin. Judge number one's eye twitched at the answer, but he continued on nonetheless. Can you tell us why the proper authorities weren't notified when situation became critical? Naruto cleared his throat as he suddenly adopted a preacher voice. Well, three, I said, I said that there are so many amendments. In the Constitution of the United States of America, I can only choose one. I can only choose one. I plead the FIF. Bang bang, I plead the FIF. Bang bang, five, one, two, three, four, FIF. Anything you say, FIF. Go ahead and ask me a question. Well, started judge number two. Naruto cut him off, FIF. Naruto then snapped his fingers and a large group of clones appeared behind him dressed like a Southern Baptist church choir and started singing. Please don't give this man no lip, sang the clone choir. You 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 and hua, sang the original, cause he gone plead d-a-f-i-f. We said don't give this man no lip, cause he gone plead d-a-f-i-f. Ah, hell nah, came from one in the back. Several members of the council got caught up in the moment and starting singing and clapping along with the clones and the churchgoers as they sung the chorus. We said don't give this man no lip, cuz he gone plead d-a-f-i-f. One, two, three, four. F-f-f-f-f-f-f-f-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-i-
Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face. They had gotten Grover to the edge of town when the first two skeleton warriors showed up. They stepped from the trees on either side of the road. Instead of gray camouflage, they now had on blue New Mexico State Police uniforms, but they still had the same transparent gray skin with yellow eyes. They drew their handguns and everyone tensed. Naruto drew his own revolver from the his left hip and pointed it at them. They had theirs pointed at Naruto as well. Talia tapped her bracelet. Aegis spiraled to life on her arm, but the warriors didn't flinch. They only stared on at Naruto with their guns. Zoe drew her bow and Annabeth pulled out one of her knives. She was holding Grover up so she could only use one. Itachi unsheathed his Stygian iron Kodachi and slid into a Kenjutsu stance. Percy uncapped his pen and Riptide came forth. Back up, Talia said. They started to but stopped when they heard rustling in the bushes behind them. Two more skeletons appeared on the road behind them. They were surrounded. Naruto drew the buster blade with his left hand and pointed it at the two behind him while keeping his gaze and gun on the two in front of him. Where are the other ones? There was at least a dozen of them back at the museum. Naruto thought as he was thinking of a battle strategy. Then one of the warriors pulled out a cell phone and started to speak. Except he wasn't speaking. He made a clattering, clicking sound, like dry teeth on bone. Naruto's eyes widened as he realized what it was doing. He was calling the others. Their brethren were now on their way towards them. Quick get back there only after me. That one just called the others and they're on their way right now. Go on ahead, I'll catch up. The others looked at him with wide eyes, but Itachi only narrowed his. Zoe was the first to speak out against his plan. No, we will stay in aid or too many. To her and the other surprise Naruto openly laughed at her will Itachi sheathed his blade and walked towards Grover. He picked him up and slung him over his shoulder and started to walk past the skeletons. Go I'll be fine, I've been in worse situations. Plus, I've killed bigger, and uglier things than these guys. Naruto said after Itachi made it past the warriors. But before they could protest Itachi called them as he walked. He can handle himself, let's go you'll only get in the way. The others reluctantly followed. Zoe had stayed rooted in her spot with her bow pointed at one of the enemies. Naruto sighed and began, knowing she wouldn't listen to him. Before the two behind him could act he put two bullets in the heads of the others. They no longer had heads and fell to the ground. Zoe quickly fired an arrow into the hand of one of the skeleton warrior's hand that had tried to shoot Naruto. But it didn't even flinch at the attack. Naruto then swung his blade and cut the same warrior in half. The last one had tried to fade around the shinobi and catch him off guard. That didn't work out too well as Zoe had fired another arrow into its side. Naruto then pivoted on one ankle and sliced the last one right down the middle. The skeleton warriors had erupted into flame, leaving nothing behind. The others were in awe of their teamwork and Naruto's skill except Itachi who was smiling at Naruto. It seems they can already work in together fairly well. Naruto nodded his thanks to Zoe who blinked in honest surprise that a man would thank her for her help. Then Naruto turned to the others and told them to move out. Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face. They walked a little further up the road. Grover kept mumbling about, the wild. Then Grover said something that caught everyone off guard. A gift. He muttered. And then the largest pug any of them had seen came crashing into the road. It gave a mighty roar. It was a wild boar, 30 feet high, with a snotty pink snout and tusks the size of canoes. Its back bristled with brown hair, and its eyes were wild and angry. Reet. It squealed, 
and raked aside three fully grown trees with its tusks. The force was so great, they went flying over several other trees and smahed into the side of the mountain, where they fell to pieces, branches and trunks twirling everywhere. Then the pig turned on them. Talia raised her spear, but Grover yelled, Don't kill it. The boar grunted and pawed at the ground, ready to charge them. Naruto looked at Itachi and spoke, You want this one or should I take care of it? Itachi just shrugged and took out a pocky stick and went to town on it. The others hadn't heard what he said and were trying to form a plan. That's the Arimanthian boar, Zoe said, trying to stay calm. I don't think we can kill it. It's a gift, Grover repeated, a blessing from the wild. The boar said, Reet, and swung its tusk. The others dived out of the way. Naruto stood his ground while Itachi was sitting cross-legged on a boulder. Yeah, I feel so blessed, Percy said, scatter. They ran in different directions but the boar had its gaze fixed on Naruto who stared right back. It wants to kill us, Talia said, of course, Grover said as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. It's wild. So how is that a blessing? Annabeth asked. It seemed like a fair question, but the pig was offended and charged at Naruto. It ran over and pulverized the sign that said, Welcome to Cloudcroft, during its charge. Zoe's eyes widened when she saw that Naruto wasn't moving. Instead he planted both feet solidly and braced himself looking ready to stop the beast with his bare hands. And he did just that. Only when he grabbed its tusks he flipped it over his back and the beast landed with a huge thud. It then tried to roll over but it slid down the hill and was caught in very deep snow. A blessing from the wild, Grover said, though he now looked agitated. I agree. Zoe said as she was still looking at Naruto. We must use it. Hold up, Talia said irritably. She looked like she just lost a fight with a Christmas tree. Explain to me why you're so sure this pig is a blessing. Grover looked distracted. It's our ride west. Do you have any idea how fast this boar can travel? Fun, like pig cowboys, Percy said. Annabeth gave a slight giggle and Naruto smiled underneath his mask. Grover nodded. We need to get aboard. I wish, I wish I had more time to look around. But it's gone now. This got Itachi interested. What's gone? The raven-haired man asked. Grover didn't seem to hear him. Which irritated Itachi but he kept quiet. He didn't want Naruto to start teasing him over his irritability. Grover walked over to the boar and jumped on its back. Already the boar was starting to make some headway through the drift. Once it broke free, there'd be no stopping it. Grover took out one of his pipes. He started playing a snappy tune and tossed an apple in front of the boar. The apple floated an SP unright above the boar's nose, and the boar went nuts, straining to get it. Automatic steering, Talia murmured. Great. She and Annabeth trudged over and jumped on behind Grover. Percy was next, then Zoe, Naruto, and Itachi. Wait a second, Percy said as he turned to Zoe. Do you know what Grover is talking about this wild blessing? Of course, Zoe said, did you not feel it in the wild? It was so strong, I never thought I would sense that presence again. What presence? Naruto asked, he overheard their conversation, it was kind of hard to ignore when they were right next to each other. She stared at Naruto with a neutral gaze, the lord of the wild, of course. Just for a moment, in the arrival of the boar, I felt the presence of Pan. They rode until sunset which was about as much as their back ends could take. Imagine riding a giant steel brush over a bed of gravel all day. That's about how comfortable boar riding was. Naruto had no idea how many miles they had covered, but the mountains faded into the distance and were replaced by miles of flat, dry land. The grass and scrub brush got sparser until they were galloping across the desert. As night fell, the boar came to a stop at a creek bed and snorted. He started drinking muddy water then ripped a saguaro cactus out of the ground and chewed it, needles and all. This is as far as he'll go, Grover said, we need to get off while he's eating. Nobody needed convincing, they slipped off the boar's back while he was busy ripping up cacti. Then the group waddled away from the beast as best they could with their saddle sores. After its third saguaro and another drink of muddy water, the boar squealed and belched, at this point Naruto held up a sign with 5.6 on it. They decided not to ask where he got it. 
The boar then whirled around and galloped back toward the east. It likes the mountains better, Percy said. Itachi nodded and looked longingly at the direction they came from. I can't blame it, Talia said. Look, ahead of them was a two-lane road half covered with sand. On the other side was a cluster of buildings too small to be a town. A boarded up house, a taco shop that looked like it hadn't opened since before Zoe Nightshade was born, and a white stucco post office with a sign that said, Gila Claw, Arizona hanging crooked above the door. Beyond that was a range of hills, but then the group slowly noticed the hills were enormous mounds of old cars, appliances, and other scrap metal. The countryside was too flat for them to be hills. It was a junkyard that seemed to go on forever. Whoa, came from Percy. Something tells me we're not going to find a car rental here. Talia said in dry humor. She looked at Grover. I don't suppose you got another wild boar up your sleeve. He better not. There are a lot of things I never want to relive and that's now in the top 10. Congrats Grover, you pissed me off more than 80% of the people I know. Naruto grumbled. Percy and Annabeth snickered while Zoe cracked a small smile. Grover was sniffing the wind, looking nervous. He fished out his acorns and threw them into the sand, then played his pipes. They rearranged themselves in a pattern that made no sense to most except Grover and possibly Zoe. The former looked concerned. That's us, he said. Those five nuts right there. Percy leaned over to get a better look. Which one is me? He asked. The little deformed one, Zoe suggested. It was Naruto's turn to snicker now and he was enjoying the great burn on Zoe's part. Oh shut up. He had an annoyed look on his face while everyone lightened up at the small joke. That cluster right there, Grover said as he pointed to the pile on the left. That's trouble. A monster. Talia asked uneasily. Groover shared her feelings. I don't smell anything, which doesn't make sense. But the acorns don't lie. Our next challenge. He didn't finish, instead opting to point straight toward the junkyard. With the sunlight almost gone now, the hills of metal looked something like an alien planet. Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face just outside junkyard. Nobody wanted to go dumpster diving for the night so the group decided to camp near the junkyard and would try to conquer it in the morning. Only Zoe and Naruto were up now, the former had produced sleeping bags for all, and were keeping guard over the camp. He never really thought about it, but now that he did Naruto noticed that most of the things the hunter needed, just appeared slung over her back. And when they didn't need it, they were gone. Similar to storage seals, Naruto thought. The night got chilly fast, so Grover and Percy collected old boards from the ruined house, and Talia zapped them with an electric shock to start a campfire. Pretty soon they were as comfy as you could get in a rundown ghost town in the middle of nowhere. Naruto had the sneaking suspicion that Itachi was just faking it and was attempting to spy on him. The stars are out, Zoe said as she stared at the night sky. Naruto looked up and noticed this as well. She was right. There were millions of them, with no city lights to turn the sky orange. Yes, they are. I've never taken the chance to look at this world's stars. There aren't that many, he said softly as he enjoyed the calmness of the moment. This is nothing, Zoe said, almost as if she was bragging. In the old days, there were more. Whole constellations have disappeared because of human light pollution. You talk as if you're not human, Naruto said softly as his gaze never wandered from the night sky. Zoe raised an eyebrow. I am a hunter. I care what happens to the wild places of the world. Can the same be said of thee? Naruto finally looked at her with a sad gaze. For you, he corrected, not thee. Zoe threw up her hands in exasperation. I hate this language. It changes too often. And you avoided the question. Naruto chuckled and nodded. Glad you caught that or I wouldn't have answered you. My old world depended more on the elements than technology. Sure we had a few things but nowhere near what this world has. We have no cars, no satellites, no major pollution. It's nice. I used to watch the stars from the mountainside in my old village. 
It was peaceful. He was reminiscing of the natural beauty of his old world. Zoe was unusually silent. She was looking at Naruto as he gazed at the stars. Tell me of your world. The request was sudden Naruto almost showed outward surprise. He chuckled and laid back in preparation of his tale. Well Konoha, my former village, was considered a moderate area. Lots of forest and rivers as well as lakes and ponds. There was this one waterfall just outside the village that was so secluded no had probably been there before because it was so out of the way. Suna was surrounded by hundreds of miles of desert and sand. Kumo was located on the side of a mountain range and was known for its thunderstorms. Iwa was in between two huge mountains and was a great canyon country. Mist was a set of islands so heavily fogged and was surrounded by oceans so vast and deep, filled with life. And those are just the major areas. Zoe was listening in rapt attention as Naruto told tales of his world's wilderness. It was just as vast and beautiful as theirs used to be. It would be nice to visit one day, she decided. They talked most of the night away before Naruto made shadow clones to take over the watch. A little a ways from them, Itachi had a small smile on his face. Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face. Junkyard, morning. The group was getting ready to move into the junkyard when a blazing light hit them from down the road. The headlights lights of a car came out of nowhere and Percy was half hoping for it to be Apollo again. Naruto couldn't blame him, but the engine was way too silent for it to be the sun chariot and, on top of that, it was nighttime. They grabbed their sleeping bags and got out of the way as a deathly white limousine slid to a stop in front of them. The back door of the limo opened right next to Percy. Before he could step away, the point of a sword touched his throat. Zoe drew her bow while Annabeth pulled out her daggers and Talia put on Aegis. As the owner got out of the car, Percy moved back very slowly. He had to, because someone was pushing the point under his chin. He smiled cruelly at Percy. Not so fast now, are you, punk? He was a big man with a crew cut, black leather biker's jacket, black jeans, a white muscle shirt, and combat boots. Wraparound shades hid his eyes, but Percy knew what was behind those glasses, hollow sockets filled with flames. Ares. Percy growled. Before the war god old respond a gun was to his chin and two knives positioned at his kidneys. Naruto had his Stygian iron pistol drawn and held to his chin while Itachi had two kunai ready to pierce his kidneys and other organs. I'd suggest you remove the sword or you'll end up looking very ugly. Naruto said in his monotone voice which was void of emotion. The war god glanced at the others before speaking. At ease, people. He snapped his fingers and their weapons fell to the ground. Except Naruto's, he was using his incredible strength to hold his pistol in place. Ares raised an eyebrow at the display. Not bad, not bad at all. Even with my godly powers you are still able to keep hold of your weapon. You can put that away now. Besides, this is a friendly meeting. He dug the point of his blade a little farther under Percy's chin and in response Naruto's gun was shoved further into the god's face. Not that he seemed to care. Of course I'd like to take your head for a trophy, but someone wants to see you. And I never behead my enemies in front of a lady. A velvety voice called from the limo as a window was rolled down. Hold on. The blonde ninja will be more than enough, actually. Ares removed his sword and shoved Percy away. You heard her punk, beat it. Blondie, come one. He snapped his fingers and the lights inside the taqueria suddenly blazed to life. The boards flew off the door and the closed sign flipped open. The rest of you can beat it. Go get some tacos. We will not leave him alone with thee, Lord Ares. Zoe said which surprised Naruto greatly. Go on, Naruto said as he turned to the group. I can handle this. You heard the man, Ares said impatiently. He's big and strong. He's got things under control. They reluctantly headed over to the taco restaurant. Zoe needed to be coaxed a little bit to leave as well as Itachi, but soon they joined the others. When he was inside Naruto saw one of the most beautiful women in his entire life. High jaw nearly dropped. 
She was wearing a red satin dress and her hair was curled in a cascade of ringlets. Her face had perfect makeup, dazzling eyes, a smile that would have lit up the dark side of the moon. He couldn't seem to know what color her hair or eyes were. Ah, there you are. I've wondered what you had been up to since that little meeting in Olympus. I am Aphrodite. Naruto did his best to remain composed and cool as possible. He put on his best emotionless face and spoke in a monotone voice. I could have guessed that. What do you want with me? She smiled even when he ignored her supposed kindness. In case you didn't know it, Naruto was not a very trusting person. You had to earn his trust. She handed him a polished mirror the size of a dinner plate and had him hold it for her. She leaned forward and dabbed at her lipstick, though he couldn't see anything wrong with it. Straight to the point, eh? I think that's one of the reasons Zeus gave you his blessing. Anyway I'm here for to make sure love prevails as it always should. Tell me why are you won this quest? Artemis has been captured and aside from that, the oracle gave me the quest. Aphrodite rolled her eyes. Oh, Artemis, please, talk about hopeless case. I mean if they were going to kidnap a goddess, she should be breathtakingly beautiful, don't you think? I pity the poor dear who have to imprison Artemis. Bow ring. Naruto stayed silent, though inside he was seething at the lake of concern for supposed family. But my dear Naruto, that is why the others are on this quest. I'm more interested in you. Naruto knew what she was talking about. The prophecy mentioned an entire line just for him. The son of death shall decide the fate of another beyond the land without rain. Quote. She brightened up immediately. Yes, now you're getting it. You are going have a chance to save little Miss Hunter. And I can smell the love in the air. Ah, like fresh daisies. Now you better woo her right or it'll all fall apart. I know she has a crush on you and you have similar feelings for her. But her damn pride as a hunter and saving Artemis means more to her right now. Make things interesting for me, okay. Naruto lost whatever calmness he had and started to stutter out in denial. But Ares grabbed him by his shoulder and threw him out of the limo. He landed on his back and heard the goddess of love shout out of her limo window one last time before leaving. Make sure to tell Percy to save Annabeth from joining the hunters. The others rushed to him as he laid still in the sand. This is gonna be a troublesome quest, he thought. What did she want with you? Annabeth asked, once Naruto had told them about Aphrodite. Said Blonde's eye was twitching as he dusted off his trench coat. Zoe watched with amusement in her eyes. Something personal, and Percy. Naruto said as he got Percy's attention. We need to talk in private, now, oh, and she said not to take anything from her husband's junkyard. The others nodded as he and Percy walked a few feet away. Zoe hesitated slightly but before she left she said one last thing with narrowed eyes. The goddess of love would not make a special to tell thee that. Be careful, Naruto, Aphrodite has led many heroes astray. Then she turned and followed the others that were waiting at the entrance to the junkyard. Percy looked at Naruto with a confused look on his face. What did you need to talk about? And why did you only need to tell me? Naruto's brows scrunched in frustration was the only sign of annoyance that Percy could see, but he could tell the blonde was not happy. Naruto sighed before he looked out at the desert. His thumb idly brushed the pistol strap to his waist. He thought over how to say what needed to be said exactly over a few seconds before he answered the question. Aphrodite requested of me to tell you about Annabeth's possible decision of joining the hunters. He said in his usual tone of voice. He didn't need to look at Percy's face to be able to tell that he was shocked into silence. He was on the verge of worrying before Percy let out a tired sigh. Naruto turned to him and saw the black-haired teen with one hand on his forehead while the other hung idle at his side. When Percy finally looked up and at the blonde he had a confused and slightly betrayed look on his face. What he said next almost threw Naruto for a loop. So, what are we going to do? Naruto blinked in surprise before he replied evenly. We, I have my own problems. Besides you're the one with a crush on her, you figure something out. Percy looked slightly shocked at the response. W what? I don't have a. Naruto had decided he had wasted enough of their limited time and cut him off to end the conversation. Don't lie to me. I can read people fairly easily and you weren't exactly keeping your emotions in check. As I said, it isn't my problem. 
We hardly know each other as it is and I don't like her in that sense of the word so it's all up to you, Percy. A little advice though, women don't like being told what to do, so don't force the subject. Talk when it's just you two and try to keep an open mind to her reasons. As the saying goes, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Just don't do something you'll regret. The look on Percy's face, whether it be one of gratitude or something else, Naruto did not know because as soon as he spoke his part the blonde left his company and walked calmly back to their waiting group. A few seconds later Percy broke from his daze and ran after Naruto to catch up. Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face face. Entrance to Junkyard. When Naruto and Percy had rejoined the group Grover was sending funny looks at Percy. To which he promptly looked in another direction. Naruto and Itachi both watched the interaction with no reactions or emotions. If they needed to know then they would simply find out. The group of seven then proceeded to walk through the massive junkyard. So, Percy said, very anxious to break the tense silence, how do we get out of here? That way. Zoe said as she pointed beyond the junkyard. That is west. How can you tell? Percy asked thoroughly confused at her statement. In the light of the full moon, Naruto was surprised he could see her roll her eyes at Percy. That got him thinking on how beautiful her eyes were. They seemed to glow in the night and had a calming aura around them. He cut out of his trance to hear Zoe retort. Ursa Major is in the north. She said. So that must be west. She pointed west. Then at the northern constellation, which was hard to make out because there were so many other stars. Percy scratched the back of his and spoke again in ignorance. Oh, yeah, the bear thing. Zoe looked offended by the statement. Show some respect. It was a fine bear. A worthy opponent. Just as Percy was about to respond a hand landed on his shoulder. When he turned he saw it was Naruto with a stern look about him. Remember that talk we had Percy. He said in a warning tone as he clenched his hand on Percy's shoulder. He didn't say anything after that and Zoe looked at him gratefully. Guys, Grover broke in on the moment. Look, they'd reached the crest of a junk mountain. Piles of metal objects glinted in the moonlight. Broken heads of bronze horses, metal legs from human statues, smashed chariots, tons of shields and swords and other weapons. Though there were more modern items as well, like cars that gleamed gold and silver, refrigerators, washing machines, and computer monitors. Whoa, Annabeth said, that stuff, some of it looks like it could be a huge advance in technology, but, none of it's finished. She looked confused at why someone would just quit halfway through something. It even looks like real gold. It is, Talia said grimly, like Naruto said, don't touch anything. This is the junkyard of the gods. Junk. Grover picked up a beautiful crown made of gold, silver, and jewels. It was broken on one side, as if it had been split by an axe. You call this junk? He bit off a point and bean to chew. It's delicious. Talia swatted the crown out of his hands. I'm serious. I don't like this place. Talia said as she gripped the shaft of her spear tightly. I agree. We should not spend an unnecessary amount of time here if we can avoid it. Let's go. I can see the exit just over there. Itachi had been having a bad feeling about even entering the damn place. And when the others started to argue while standing in a place that could possibly kill them. Well he wasn't happy. Naruto nodded and began to walk at a sedated pace towards the exit. The others followed behind him too involved in their mindless small talk to even notice that Naruto and Zoe were walking side by side with small smiles on their faces. Well, Itachi did, but he never did talk much to begin with. 
Cheeky smiley face, 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 cheeky smiley face face. Morning. At the edge of the dump, they found a tow truck so old it might have been thrown away itself. But the engine started, and it had a full tank of gas, so they decided to borrow it. Itachi was driving, and even though he was still new at it he was decent. Talia, Annabeth, Grover, and Percy rode in the truck while Naruto and Zoe sat in the bed of the pickup truck. Naruto was leaning his back against the windows of the truck while Zoe sat to the side. The skeletons are still out there. Zoe said to the blonde. We need to keep moving. The ones that are left anyway. Naruto mumbled. Talia navigated them through the desert, under clear blue skies, the sand so bright it hurt to look at it. The air was cool and dry, but the nice weather was just the calm before the storm. Then suddenly the whole world went dark. Last time. The skeletons are still out there. Zoe said to the blonde. We need to keep moving. The ones that are left anyway. Naruto mumbled. Talia navigated them through the desert, under clear blue skies, the sand so bright it hurt to look at it. The air was cool and dry, but the nice weather was just the calm before the storm. Then suddenly the whole world went dark. The quest members and Itachi groggily woke up to the sounds of tormented souls. Three of them knew where they were immediately after hearing those loud wails. They were in the underworld. As Percy and the others regained their bearings Naruto was already on his feet, wondering as to why his father had decided to intrude upon their quest. Zoe was also quick to her feet along with Itachi. Zoe was tense, and with good reason. It wasn't every day you woke up a found yourself in the underworld. And the others, who had finally recognized where exactly they were, fully supported her feelings. Calm down. My father has called us here. For whatever reason, I do not know. Naruto spoke in his usual monotone voice. He was in a casual stance to the untrained eye, but he was always ready for battle, ready for someone to try to take his life. A big, and I mean big, mistake on the attacker's part. It was something that slightly saddened Zoe as she was able, albeit barely, to see it. What cruel life had he led to not even let his guard down even in the presence of his parent? Itachi was one of the few even able to see that very thing in Naruto's posture, and it saddened him greatly. But one good thing came out of it. It meant Naruto was back to being his old self and it wouldn't be changing anytime soon. Hades had taken note of it as well, but he understood the reaction came from his occupation as a shinobi. To let one's guard down, even for a second, more often than not lead to death. They had woken up in the main room of Hades' abode, to which many looked around at the decor oddly. The doors leading to another room opened alerting everyone to the presence of a newcomer. Hades walked into the room with a calm and neutral look about him, appearing as if he had no qualms with any one of them. Hey, yeah right, he walked right up to Naruto and promptly slapped him upside the head. Before anyone could react the god EXL potted into a raging rant. What the hell were you thinking? You knew not to poke your nose where it didn't belong and you did it anyway. Do you know how much I hate going to meetings with minor gods to get their blessings so you would not be limited in battle? Your abilities could have been taken from you but no, let dear old daddy deal with it. You just had to mouth off in your meeting with Zeus. Next time think before you act. Do you remember the first thing you learned from me? Hades had gradually calmed down throughout the rant. It was clear the god of the dead did not care much for most of the minor gods. It is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Naruto stated as he rubbed the back of his head. His mood had now effectively taken a turn for the worse. Hey, nobody likes to screw up. If had just waited and not mentioned your techniques or abilities then I wouldn't have had to reduce myself to asking for permission. He hissed out the last word as if it was a curse. Zoe and the other quest members sweat dropped at the odd seam, while Itachi looked on boredly. The god turned his attention to the raven-haired shinobi before continuing. Itachi, your part in this quest is done. For now I need you to find any and all supply routes, 
hideouts, anything you can get, that are connected to Kronos forces. I'm sure you'll enjoy yourself while you, ah, take care of them. Now I'll be sending the rest of you close to the Hoover Dam. There's something there you need to find my nephew. He spoke the last part to Percy as he stared seemingly into his soul. Before anyone could say anything, ask any questions, or protest, the world once again went black. Hoover Dam. They felt as if they had been flushed down a toilet. Everything was spinning, and no one had a clear view of their surroundings. Finally as the group regained their bearings Talia spoke. Hoover Dam. Talia said, it's huge. They stood at the river's edge, looking up at a curve of concrete that loomed between the cliffs. People were walking along the top of the dam. They were so tiny they looked like fleas. The group, though still in awe of the construct, were grumbling, not in words but mainly grunts and huffs, but it was obvious they were not fans of Hades' mode of transportation. 700 feet tall, Percy started as he stared up at the massive dam. Built in the 1930s. 5 million cubus acres of water. Talia picked up. Grover sighed, largest construction project in the United States. Both Zoe and Naruto raised their eyebrows to the stated facts. Annabeth ignored the conversation and continued to stare in awe of the Hoover Dam. How do you know all that? Zoe finally questioned. Annabeth, Percy said, she liked architecture. She was nuts about monuments. This was Talia, again. Spouted facts all the time. Grover groaned in fake agony. So annoying. I wish she was here. Percy said. This seemed to at last get Annabeth's attention as she slapped all three in the back of the head. I am here you idiots, so stop talking like I'm dead. Now Naruto and Zoe cracked small smiles before turning back to the dam. Well let's not waste any time then. My father sent us here for a reason, and I'd like to not waste too much time. We've got so little left every second counts. Naruto said as he started walking with the others lagging behind him. Inside Hoover Dam, Percy had wandered off while the rest of the group was getting some much needed food. As this was happening Annabeth asked a question that had been bugging her since the start of the quest. Naruto, she asked. The blonde shinobi looked at her as he took another bite of an enchilada and nodded for her to continue. Well, I was wondering as to why you haven't used your motorcycle yet. I mean, it would speed up travel. The others looked at him as well for an explanation. The more they thought about it the more they wondered as to why he hadn't used such a helpful tool yet. Naruto swallowed the bite he had taken and sighed slightly, he seemed to be doing that a lot more lately than he would have liked. Simple, I can carry at most two people on it at a time. And splitting our forces is almost never a wise move. They nodded their understanding and were about to resume their meals when Percy rushed towards them. We have to go. Percy had wandered off while the rest of the group was getting some much needed food. As this was happening Annabeth asked a question that had been bugging her since the start of the quest. Naruto, she asked. The blonde shinobi looked at her as he took another bite of an enchilada and nodded for her to continue. Well, I was wondering as to why you haven't used your motorcycle yet. I mean, it would speed up travel. The others looked at him as well for an explanation. The more they thought about it the more they wondered as to why he hadn't used such a helpful tool yet. Naruto swallowed the bite he had taken and sighed slightly, he seemed to be doing that a lot more lately than he would have liked. Simple, I can carry, at most, two people on it at a time. And splitting our forces is almost never a wise move. They nodded their understanding and were about to resume their meals when Percy rushed towards them. We have to go, inside Hoover Dam, what the hell? Came the deadpan reply of Naruto. To be fair the scene he was watching deserved it as well as the uncontrollable twitch his right eye was having. The group had turned to see Percy running, and on occasion shoving, through the crowd of people separating them. Not a moment later the screaming started with the clattering of skeleton teeth. As the others dropped their food and pulled out their weapons Naruto remained where he was and continued to munch on his enchilada. What are thy doing? Zoe hissed as she knocked an arrow and took aim at one of the skeletons. All around them the cafe windows on the observation floor gave them a beautiful panoramic view of the skeletal army that had come to kill them. Naruto counted two on the cast side of the dam road, blocking the way to Arizona. Three more on the west side, guarding Nevada. All of them were armed with batons and pistols, just great more guns. 
However the immediate problem was a lot closer. The three skeletal warriors who'd been chasing Percy in the turbine room now appeared on the stairs. They saw Naruto across the cafeteria and clattered their teeth. I'm finishing my damn meal. In case you hadn't noticed, today hasn't exactly been stellar for me so far. Besides you guys can handle figuring an exit. Naruto replied as Zoe was ready to turn around and reprimand him but Grover beat her to it. Elevator, he shouted. The group bolted in that direction with Naruto covering the rear after he finished his food. But the doors opened with a pleasant ding, and one more warrior stepped out. Every warrior was accounted for, minus the two Naruto killed in New Mexico. They were completely surrounded. Then Grover had a brilliant, totally Grover-like idea. Burrito fight, he yelled, and flung his guacamole grande at the nearest skeleton. It knocked his skull clean off of his shoulders. The group wasn't sure what the other kids in the cafe saw, but they went crazy and started throwing their burritos and baskets of chips and sodas at each other, shrieking and screaming. The skeletons tried to aim their guns, but it was hopeless. Bodies and food and drinks were flying everywhere. In the chaos, Talia and Percy tackled the other two skeletons on the stairs and sent them flying into the condiment table. Then they all raced downstairs, guacamole grandes whizzing past their heads. What now? Grover asked as they burst outside. No one had an answer. The warriors on the road were closing in from either direction. They ran across the street to the pavilion with the winged Bronx statues as Naruto put a bronze bullet through a skeleton's head that too close to Annabeth for comfort. But that put their backs to the mountain. The skeletons moved forward, forming a crescent around them. Their brethren from the cafe were running up to join them. One was still putting its skull back on its shoulders. Another was covered in ketchup and mustard. Two more had burritos lodged in their rib cages. They didn't look happy about it they drew batons and advanced. Four against eleven, Zoe muttered. And for some reason only Naruto can kill them. About that, Naruto muttered back. I've been thinking that has something to do with me being a son of Hades. And nice job with the burrito Grover, great shot. Thanks, it's been nice adventuring with you guys. Grover said, his voice trembling and leave it to Percy to ruin the moment. Whoa, he said, their toes are really bright. Ah, the statues, so that's what he's talking about. Percy, Talia said, this isn't the time, but Percy couldn't help staring at the two giant bronze statues with tall bladed wings like letter openers. They were weathered brown except for their toes, which shone like new pennies from all the times people had rubbed them for good luck. Talia, Percy said, pray to your dad. She glared at him. He never answers. Try it, Naruto said. Talia turned and glared at him now. It's not like we can lose anything by trying. Besides, we're running out of options. Talia was still glaring at him but took a second to look around. Annabeth and Grover were silently pleading with her while Naruto and Zoe had formed a human wall between the two groups so the rest of their group could have some breathing room. Fine, she gritted out. Talia closed her eyes. Her lips moved in a silent prayer. Percy put in his own prayer to Annabeth's mom, Athena, hoping that it was her that he had met in the elevator that she was trying to help save her daughter. And nothing happened. The skeletons closed in. They prepared their weapons and got ready for a fight. Then a shadow fell over them. Then they realized it was the shadow of a pair of enormous wings. The skeletons looked up too late. A flash of bronze, and all five of the baton wielders were swept aside. As the others aimed their guns at them Naruto grabbed Zoe and moved in front of her, ready to take the hit. She was stunned, even though it wasn't necessary. The other skeletons opened fire but the bronze angels had stepped in front of them and folded their wings like shields. Bullets pinged off of them like rain off of a metal roof. Both angels slashed outward, and the skeletons went flying across the road. Man, it feels good to stand up. The first angel said. His voice sounded tinny and rusty, as if he hadn't had a drink since he'd been built. Will y'all look at my toes? The other said, holy Zeus, what were those tourists thinking? As stunned as everyone was they got over it really quickly. They kind of had to with everything they had experienced on this quest so far. The skeletons were recovering though. A few of them were getting up again, reassembling, bony hands groping for their weapons. Naruto took two quick shots and two heads exploded into golden dust. Trouble, Percy said, get us out of here. 
Talia yelled. Both angels looked down at her. Zeus's kid, yes. Could I get a please, Miss Zeus's kid? One of the angels asked. Please, was Talia's panicked reply. The angels looked at each other and shrugged. Could use a strect, one decided. The next thing any one of them knew what happened, one of them grabbed Percy, Annabeth, and Grover, while the other grabbed Talia Naruto and Zoe. Then they flew straight up, over the dam and the river, the skeleton warriors shrinking to tiny specks below them and the sound of gunfire echoing off the sides of the mountains. Tell me when it's over, Talia said, her eyes were shut tight. The statue was holding on to them so they couldn't fall, but still Talia clutched Naruto's arm like it was the most important thing in the world. Something Zoe didn't exactly like. Hold still, Naruto said as he gripped a pressure point on her neck and put her to sleep. He noticed Zoe's questioning glance and decided to elaborate. This way she doesn't freak out for the rest of the flight. She nodded as it made sense. Talia would still try to kick his ass when she came to. She wouldn't succeed, but she would definitely try. We are in the Sierras, Zoe said as she tried to break the ice. She wasn't sure how to approach the subject of him throwing himself in harm's way for her. I have hunted here before. At this speed, we should be in San Francisco in a few hours. Naruto just nodded. She was getting used to him being silent unless it was important to the quest. Hey, hey, Frisco. Their angel said, yo, Chuck, we could visit those guys at the mechanics monument again. They know how to party. Oh, man, the other angel said. I am so there. As Percy started to converse with the angels and the others Naruto turned away from the beautiful mountain view. So, he began getting her attention. Are we going to talk about what happened or are we going to continue to pretend nothing happened? Zoe froze up for a few seconds before lowering her head so her eyes were shadowed. Why? She whispered, knowing he could hear her. He knew what she was confused as to why he was willing to take a bullet for her. Naruto was silent for several moments as he contemplated his answer. Sure he only knew of familial love, but that was only because of the few good people he had bonded with. Old man Sarutobi, Kakashi, Itachi, Gara, Killer B, and Tsunade after he convinced her to come back and be Hokage so the old man could retire. That wasn't counting the others he had healthy relationships with like Anko and Kurenai. But love of another person, he had never been in love like that before. He didn't really know if he ever would be. But one thing was for certain. He cared for Zoe more than that of a familial bond. In the end he decided the truth was the best option. Besides, if she didn't feel the same way that was the worst thing that could happen. He'd get over it anyway, he always did. I'm not quite sure to be honest. I've never been, in love, with anyone before. But, I do care about you, more so than that of anything else I've ever felt. He waited a several seconds for her to respond, and finally she raised her head to look him in the eye. Her eyes were watering as she reached out and grasped his hand and gripped it tightly. His eyes softened as he returned it and waited for her words. Please, don't make me regret this, she said softly, before he could question her though she did something even he hadn't expected. She kissed him. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.